Let's read from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 10. Chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and from verse 17 through 31. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 31. Mark 10, verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, All these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters in, or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. We've been speaking, uh, since we finished the Gospel of Luke, we've been speaking on Christian idols these last few weeks, and we'll continue to do so for the next while. I'm not sure how many there will be in the series. Uh, This is the second one, and I would encourage you, if you did not see the first one or you weren't here last week, to watch it on YouTube. I believe that these are very, very important messages for the time in which we are living. As my time in this church is coming to a close, I'm trying to address those things that I believe are absolutely essential uh, for us to know and to remember. Um, this This morning I want to speak about another one of these idols, and I understand that these messages are difficult to accept. I understand that People are and get upset when we speak about these things. Uh, That's just the way it is. I cannot not speak the word that I believe needs to be spoken uh, because we're uh, we're afraid of people's reactions. Unfortunately, when we speak about these things, and again, we're going to get very practical this morning, when we speak about these things, um, uh, there are three possible responses. The one response is to get angry with the preacher and to lash out at the preacher. Um, and some do that very well. Uh, the, the other is to, is to play Teflon. Nothing sticks. You sit here and say, Amen, 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 when in fact the message may be for you. And then the third, which really in the end are just the very few who will hear the word and respond and repent and make right that which needs to be made right. So these are are difficult things. And I want to speak this morning about families. I spoke last week about self as the great idol. And it all flows from that. But family can be an idol. And I know immediately you say, well, you know, this, this pastor is against families. I'm not against families. I'm all for family. Family is very, very important. Family is important in the word of God. 
But the problem with all of these things is that the good gifts of God can often become idols. Money is something God gives us, which is helpful and useful to be able to preach the gospel in order to uh, live our lives. But when money takes its wrong place in our lives, it becomes an idol. Uh, I think we're mainly adults here, but relationships between men and women is a gift from God. But we know how that the world has taken that and has perverted it into an idol and worshipped that. And uh, unfortunately in the church this happens sometimes too. Knowledge is a gift of God. And yet there are many, and there's a whole sect in the Old Testament, in the New Testament time, and still continues today, called the Gnostics, who build their whole faith around knowledge, um, uh, knowing things. Um, the knowledge is a good thing. God is all-knowing. It's the very nature of God. Um, but at the same time, when knowledge is elevated to a, 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 a wrong level, it becomes an idol. Political liberty is a great gift of God to us in this country. But when that is elevated beyond its right place, it becomes an idol. And the list can go on and on and on, and the same obviously applies to family. Now you'll notice that in this passage, and I'm going to, I'm not going to preach on this passage, I'm going to come back to the last few verses because there are certain principles here, but you'll notice that one of the points that Jesus makes in verse 19 is, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Jesus is quoting the Ten Commandments. Remember, the Ten Commandments consists of the first four commandments relate to our relationship with God. The next six commandments relate to our relationship with one another. The first of those six Interestingly, interestingly enough, and I, I don't believe that it's coincidence, because remember, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. That's what we're dealing with. So that is the most important, if you will, of the four. Of the six, it seems that the most important is the fifth command, which is the first of the six, which is honor your father and your mother. And so entrenched in the law is the concept of family is the concept of the relationship between parents and children. In Psalm 68, verse 6, Psalm 68, verse 6, God sets the solitary in families. The solitary, those who are alone. God sets those who are alone in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. And what he's speaking about here is the church. God brings those who are without family, those who are alone, into the family of God. In fact, the church is patterned on God and his son on heaven. Remember that we are the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. The relationship between the bridegroom and the bride is reflected in the church. And so the church becomes a picture and a pattern of God's ultimate desire for the family. We are called brothers and sisters because we are part of the family of God, with God as our Father. One of the most important things that happens as a result of our salvation is that we are able to cry, Father. We're able to call God our Father, not like so many people call God their Father, but He is not a fa their Father in reality. But in reality, knowing the fatherhood of God, many who have grown up without fathers or have grown up with fathers who have not reflected the God, uh, godly fatherhood have found in God their father in a very real and a very practical way. And so the church is patterned after the family. The Godhead is the ultimate family. God reveals himself as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Why does he not reveal himself as God and the Word? Because remember, Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. But why does he choose to reveal himself as Father and Son rather than God and Word? 
because of the importance of family. So family is absolutely essential. Family is important. It is important that as Christians we have our families are godly families. But as we've said, with anything that is good, we're able to take those good things and we turn them into idols. Now I want us to go to the, uh, to the Old Testament and I'm going to begin in Numbers chapter 14. Now what happens in Numbers 14 is that God had brought Israel out of Egypt, you remember, and he brings them to the promised land. Uh, this is probably six months after they had come out of Egypt. And he prepares them to cross over the River Jordan and to take possession of the land. The people of Israel rebel against God and they say, we're not going in. There are too many problems and we want to go back to Egypt. Well, let's have an election. And they, they said, we're going to uh, elect a man uh, who will lead us and who will, who will take us back to Egypt. Uh, they said, uh, second best, rather than going to Egypt, is that we die in the wilderness. Now, remember that, that God's plan for them was to enter into the land, them and their children and their families. And that in that land, he was going to bless them. It's going to be a land of milk and honey. It's going to be a land of prosperity, a land of where they would be safe, a land where they would have independence after having been slaves for hundreds of years. God just wanted the best for them, but they wouldn't do what God wanted for them. And I want you to notice the, one of the reasons they give for not obeying God. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? That our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So their excuse was, there are giants in the land, and the giants are going to kill our children and our wives. Now that wasn't the real reason. The real reason is they were running scared. But they hid behind the women and the children. It becomes the excuse for not doing what God wanted them to do. Now remember, what God wanted them to do was not onerous. God was going to give them the victory. God was going to give the land to them. The enemy, in fact, was ready to run out the other side the moment they crossed the River Jordan. Forty years later, you remember, they, uh, the spies go and they, uh, they, they lodge with Rahab. And Rahab says, when you guys came 40 years ago, we were ready to run. But they never came. Israel never crossed the river. God had already put the fear of Israel and of their God in the inhabitants of the land. But they said, no, our wives and our children. And I want you to see the, the consequence of this. In verse 28, there's a long conversation between God and Moses. But the bottom line is, say to them, God says to Moses, now say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. In other words, what you want is what you're going to get. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. And we know that was 600,000 men. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. You see, they wouldn't do what God wanted them to do. And they said, our kids will be victims. In fact, one of the main reasons why people don't obey God in the way that they relate to their families and the way they run their families it says, oh no, it's, it's not good for the kids. As a result, they didn't enter the land. But as for you, your carcasses will fall in the wilderness. And your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years. Now look at this. 
and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. For 40 years, those kids had to live in the wilderness because of the parents' disobedience. And folk, when we are disobedient to God, we bring a judgment upon our children. And we bring drought and famine and hardship and difficulty into, their, into, your, into our families because we will not do what God has asked us to do. In fact, the problem goes way back. Remember that right at the very beginning, God makes Adam and Eve. And Eve is deceived, and she eats of the fruit that she should not. But the New Testament tells us in the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy, that Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what was going on. But what did Adam do? He chose obedience to his wife. Or he chose his wife. Let me rather put it that way. Rather than obedience to God. That's what Adam did. And in the process, he sold us all down the river. Every one of us. Because of Adam's sin, death has passed, the scripture says, on all flesh. I don't know what would have happened, and we can only guess, if Adam said, I'm not going with Eve. I'm with God. And God said, don't eat. I think there would have been a very, very different story. I think the whole of history would have been different. Jesus would not have needed to die. Eve would have died for her sin. But God would have raised up another woman, maybe, for, for Adam. But Adam chose his wife over God. She had become his idol. She had become his God. In Genesis chapter 19, we find another story. And what had happened in Genesis 19 is, you remember that Lot had fled from Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife turned back. She had her own idols of the city, the stuff that she owned, the house and stuff that she had in the city. She turns into a pillar of salt. Lot continues to flee with his two daughters. And in Genesis 19.31, the firstborn, the first of the two daughters, said to the younger, Our father is old and there is no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. In other words, we don't have children. We don't have children. We don't have family. Come, let us make our father drunk, drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. What's this all about? Family. Family. Now, was God not able to give Lot progeny? Was God not able to give Lot descendants? Well, remember that parallel to the story of Lot, and I'm going to come to Abraham in a moment, but parallel to the story of Lot is Abraham. Abraham is past having children, age-wise. His wife is barren. She's past the age of having children. And yet God gives him not just children, but gives him children as many as the sand on the seashore and as the stars in heaven. So could God give Lot a family? Yes, he could. But they chose family over God because they knew what they were doing was not right. And so they lie with their father. Now, I didn't give you the scriptures because I know I'm going to run short of time. But out of this relationship between Lot and his two daughters come two nations, two families. Moab and Ammon. These are two of the families, two of the nations, in addition to Amalek, there's another story with Amalek, also family, that gave Israel a hard time 
fought against them over and over. Saul fought against them. David fought against them. But Solomon worshipped their gods. Now the God of the Ammonites, for those who know the scriptures, will know that the God of the Ammonites is a God known as Molech. M-O-L-E-C-H. Or sometimes spelled M-O-L-O-C-H. What was Molech known for? What was the hallmark of the worship of this God of Molech? Child sacrifice. Abortion. Abortion is the modern form of child sacrifice. A terrible form of worship. You see, that which was born out of the worship of the family resulted in the murder of the children. Can you see the connection? God is not mocked. But parallel to the story is the story of Abraham. And, and there are many, many stories that I can take from right through the Old Testament. And I've only selected these few. And we know the story of Abraham. God comes to him and he says a very strange thing to him. He said, God said to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Remember, this is John 3.16 in the Old Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The son that God loved, the Lord Jesus. So he says to him, take your only son whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now let me just explain that God does not sanction child sacrifice. God is not asking for child sacrifice because God is testing Abraham. God would never have gone through with this. So God is not encouraging the sacrifice, but God is testing Abraham. Because remember, what was important to Abraham? This boy. Abraham had waited over a hundred years for a descendant. And God had promised him that he would have a descendant. And not only would have one descendant, but he would have multitudes. Abraham's whole life is bound up in this one boy. Remember, he had another son who wasn't really a true son. He was born out of disobedience to God. Again, Abraham trying to do what God didn't want him to do. Trying to take matters in his own hands and raise up his own family. And he raises up Ishmael, out of whom come the Arab nations, who are still fighting with Israel to this very day. And so here's Isaac, and God says, give him up. And we know the story. He takes the boy, puts him on the altar, and raises up the knife. I can't imagine what went on in Abraham's heart at that moment. But what I see is a man who feared God above all else. Who loved the Lord more than he loved his son. And folk, that is what God is asking of us. And I know you're sitting here and you're saying, well, preacher, that's impossible. Well, if you love anything more than you love him, it is an idol. And if you're not willing to give it up, You're not saved. You say, well, that's strong preaching. Remember, we looked at some of these verses last week. That those who are idolaters will not enter into the kingdom. In other words, they're not saved. Because they're not worshipping God. They're worshipping something else besides God. And God tests Abraham and he says, remember, this is not the first time God tested Abraham. Because Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. 
And God said, go to the promised land. And what did Abraham have to do? At that point, Abraham is young in his faith. Abraham had just had uh, some kind of very brief encounter with God. He hadn't had all these years of walking with God. But what was the choice Abraham had to make at that point? Do I stay with my family? Or do I obey God and go to the land that he has promised me? And Abraham leaves all of his relationships except Lot. And we know what happened with Lot who came with him. Lot just gave him grief all along. You see, it's not that God wanted to destroy Abraham's family. God wanted to give him something better. God does not want to take things away from us in order to rob us or in order to deprive us or in order to, for us to, 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 to suffer. But he wants to rid us of our idols that he might give us something better, something greater. And so he said, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. And he said, by myself, we've seen this in the book of Hebrews, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. Your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And your seed, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Speaking of Jesus, because you have obeyed my voice. What a difference between Lot. And, and admittedly, Lot didn't have much to do with that because Lot was stoned out of his mind, which he shouldn't have been to begin with. And Abraham. Out of the one comes the Messiah. Out of the one comes the church and the great nation of Israel. And out of the other comes idolaters who attack the people of God. And the difference is simply, who is your God? In Luke chapter 14, great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now remember, Jesus is not saying we must hate our family. I want to emphasize that. I don't want anyone to get the impression, and I know what happens on YouTube is people skip over certain sections and they listen to certain bits and they run away with it and say, well, this preacher is against families. I'm not against families. God is not against families. And God is not telling us that we must hate parents. Cults build on these verses because cults expect people to walk away from their families and to uh, sell their souls to the cult leaders. But what he is speaking about, because clearly we, we read in Mark that Jesus says, honor father and mother. So then is he contradicting himself when he says that if you, you, you need to hate father and mother, how can you honor your father and mother and hate them? No, clearly Jesus is not saying we must hate in that sense. But that our love for God must be so much greater than our love for family that our love for family looks like hate. It's simply a degrees of comparison. And he says, if anyone comes to me and does not, in other words, if you're not willing to do what Abraham did and surrender, now remember, Abraham didn't take his boy and say, yeah, go into the wilderness and let the lions catch you. What did Abraham do with his son? He surrendered him to God. He put him in God's hands. 
This does not mean that we don't do, fulfill our obligations and our responsibilities as parents. But we don't worship our children or the rest of the family. And Jesus says, if you're not willing to give up. You see, it's not what exactly with Abraham, why Abraham's example is so important. It's not what happens. It's what's in our hearts. Are you willing to give it up? And that applies to anything. That applies to the worship of yourself. It applies to money. It applies to pride. It applies to anything. God may not ask you to give up your money. But if you're not willing to give it up, there's a problem. And I don't believe that God is asking anyone here except my wife and I to give up family. But you need to be willing to. Because if you're not willing to surrender everything, you cannot be his disciple. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus said, He who loves father and mother more than me. See, here's where it comes down to. Loving father and mother, and this would apply to the rest of the family, more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm going to come back to this idea at the end because I want to get practical now. But... This is the principle. The principle is that if we are willing to lose things for his sake, we will gain them. Here he's speaking about your life. But in the passage that we read in Mark, he's talking about all sorts of other things. The things that we try and hold on to, he says you're going to lose it. The things that you're willing to let go, you will gain it. You see, because at the end of the day, it's not up to us to keep our lives together. It's not up to us to keep our families together. Folk, you can do everything you, you, you like. You can try and apply yourself as hard as you like. But if God does not keep your family, it will not be kept. And this is the problem, is that we try and do what we cannot do. We cannot save our children. Only God can. So best we surrender them to God and say, Lord, I give them to you. That's why so many Christians make a mess of their lives. Because they want to run their own lives. Instead of saying, Lord, I can't run my life. I don't make good decisions. But Lord, I surrender myself to you. You live your life through me. So let's get practical. And this is where the offense comes because everyone agrees with me up to this point. Mostly. When we miss church for family activities, we've chosen family over God. I understand there are times that we have to pay attention to the family. But here's the problem. Church is at the most three hours a week. And yet there are many who find it hard to give God those three hours. When in fact they have 24 times 7 with family. Family has 99% of your time anyhow. God's asking for 1%. I don't know. I didn't do the sums. Somebody who's clever in math can work out 24 times 7 and work out what 3 is as a percentage of that, but it's very, very small. Oh, I can't come to church. Family have arrived. Well, 
Oh, the kids have got something on. We can't go to church. Probably one of the points in which I felt the most disgust in my own heart. God needs to help me with that. Was when a preacher asked me to preach a series of messages on a Wednesday night, I think it was. Because he has to go to Little League with his kids. A preacher cannot do his job because he has to be with the kids. When we neglect strangers at Thanksgiving, Christmas, remember that God sets the solitary in families. There are those amongst us who do not have family. But because we worship our family, we won't let anyone else in. It's just us. Families in church who do not mix with others outside of their families. This is not just a problem here. This is a problem in many small churches where small families dominate or when large families dominate small churches. And outsiders just feel like outsiders because they're not part of the family. Because you see, blood is more important than spirit. Blood can never be more important than spirit. Remember, they come to Jesus, they say, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. And Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of my father. Jesus was not disrespectful to his mother. And remember, he takes care of her right up to the end. But Jesus acknowledges that spirit is more important than blood. And this family here should be more important than your blood family. When parents won't allow their kids to mix with kids of other families because they feel a sense of superiority you've made a god of your family kids who are taught by their parents that they are Christians and they're saved because they're born into a Christian family in fact I'm not talking about those in Historic churches, I'm talking about people in evangelical churches, where kids are raised to believe that you are a Christian. Because we will not tell them that you are a sinner, because that's going to hurt the kid's psyche. We will not admit to the fact that the kid is naughty, because we believe that they're angels. If you believe, folk hear me, if you believe that your kids are angels and you believe that they are geniuses, you have made an idol of your kids. It's as simple as that. So, well, why, how can you say that? Because here's the reality, your kids are not angels. I have not seen any children, and I love children. I've loved your children as my own. But I've never seen a child who is an angel. Because evil, the scripture says, is bound up in the heart of the child. If you believe your kids are a genius... You're deceived. Your kid may be first in their class. It doesn't make them a genius. 
And even if they were a genius, it doesn't necessarily make them a nice kid. I've told you before, I want that bumper sticker on the back of my car. My cat is more clever than your honor student. Folks, you see, you say, well, why is this a big issue? It's a big issue because it speaks to our hearts. If you really believe that your kids are angels, you really believe that they are geniuses, and there's nobody as clever as your kids, it speaks to your state of mind. You cannot see the reality. You cannot see the truth. Now, they may be good kids. They may be clever. But you've turned them into idols. Remember the guy who takes a piece of wood and cooks his food on it and takes the other half of the log that he cut and he falls down and he worships it and he can't see the stupidity that this thing is a piece of wood. And when parents can't see that their kids are not that bright or they are not that, you know, that there are others that are more clever than them or that they're not as angelic as they think, they made an idol. All right, we need to move on. Drawing your happiness, fulfillment, and identity from the family rather than from Christ. When family identifies who you are rather than being a Christian. And I know it's maybe not a good time to talk about that, but I need to. The evidence comes at the grave. When the family has become everything, and God has become less, it's evident in the way people mourn. I'm not disrespecting those who have lost loved ones very recently. And those who have lost, lo lost loved ones as time has gone on. But folk, if we're not willing to put God first, when we lose family, everything falls apart. Because my whole hope, my whole life, my whole everything is bound up in my family. Many parents and grandparents love to brag on their kids and their grandkids. And that's fine. But the problem comes when we're quick to brag on our kids and slow to brag on Christ. When all we can do is talk about our kids and what they do and how they this and that. And we find it hard to speak about Jesus. I, you, I know you say, well, that's not possible. Yes, that's possible. I have seen it. I've seen it here. Because what my heart is filled with is family and not Jesus. And that flows on to... Parents and grandparents who just want to speak about their kids and they can't listen to others speak about theirs. Now there are dangers and I need to move on otherwise I'm going to run out. And I want to speak about very quickly about the practical problems that come with when we worship family. And they don't know particular order but the one thing that happens is that kids feel suffocated. Because their parents are hovering over them all the time. Parents are just trying to protect and to guard them because this is my little treasure. I'm not talking about being responsible parents. I'm not talking about being safe and doing all of the right things. But it becomes excessive. And the result of that is that those kids will act out when they are teenagers. You may be able to hold them and you may be able to, 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 to keep them restricted until they get to 12, 13, and 14. And then they will act out. I've seen this in cults over and over and over. 
I've seen this in families over and over. And that which you try to hold on to, you will lose. Kids grow up narcissistic and self-centered because they've been taught that everything revolves around me and us and our family. We spoke about that last week. That leads to the worship of self because the kids are being taught to worship myself from small. And, and folk, again, let me, we, we don't have the time, but, but let, me, let me just explain that when we did the parenting series, and I know it's a long time ago, and I know that a lot of that wasn't acceptable. But when the baby, there is a progression. When the baby is first born, yes, everything revolves around that baby. When it says, eh, you need to be there. And you need to wipe it, and you need to wash it, and you need to feed it, and you need to do all of these things. But that needs to change as the child grows older. But unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't change. And so we have 50-year-old and 60-year-old babies in the world today who still think everything revolves around me because they never grew up, because the parents never taught them that they are not the center of everything. Families that are built around children fall apart when the kids leave the family. We've seen that over and over. Because the parents never had a relationship. All they can talk about is the kids. Oh, we've got to get Johnny to school tomorrow. We've got to buy Susie a new dress. We've got to do this and that and the other thing. Oh, did you see what he did? It's all about the kids. All the focus, all the attention is about the kids. And the parents drift apart. And the kids leave the home. And you wonder why you have so many empty nesters in the divorce courts. Isolationism is contrary to the Great Commission. It leads to disobedience. The Great Commission is go into the world and preach the gospel. But no, we want us for no more. Our little family. And that leads to disobedience to God. And what happens in that process is that the same as we spoke about last week about self, is that we then adjust our theology to suit our disobedience. And I know that there are those who may be here this morning and those who are online who will find every verse in the Bible about how important family is. And why we should not discipline our children. Why we should worship them. Why we should be constantly affirming them, telling them that they're the greatest, they're the cleverest, they're the prettiest. I've seen pastors change their theology to suit their disobedience in families. Folk, the question simply is, are you going to be more obedient to God than to your kids? Because here's the problem. Modern families are not built around parents, they're built around kids. And parents obey the kids. Because otherwise the kid's going to throw a tantrum. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to God or are you listening to your family. Let's go to Mark chapter 10, and I'm going to draw to a close. The passage we began with. So Jesus answered and said, Assured, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children and lands for my sake and the gospels, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters, mothers and children, lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. 
I'm not going to analyze those verses. But this is the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. That nothing we give up for him. Folk, I'm not asking you to divorce your husband or your wife. I'm not asking you to kick your, your children out. I'm asking you just to put things in their right place. Make sure that God is in his right place in your heart and life. And when we do that, God honors that. And he honors it, he says here, a hundred times over. Folk, there is nothing that we have to surrender that God asks us to do. It doesn't matter what it is, that God will not repay. God is not unjust. God is not unfair. God is not an ogre who wants to take stuff from us just to deprive us. But he wants us to get our lives right so that he can bless us. Yes, we've spoken about the dangers, and the dangers are real. But at the end of the day, what's more important is that I have God's blessing in my life and that I have God's blessing in my family. Maybe you're tired of the story, but let me remind you. of my own personal experience and Inna's experience. I think we'd been married 20 years when we came here. A long time. Our marriage was not good. Never was good. But God brought us here. God brought me here. And I remember calling Inna and telling her that I have to stay here. It was long before the internet was in its infancy stages. We were using the under, undersea telephone line, costing a fortune every minute. And Inna had to make a choice her family, or obedience to God. What a choice. We just moved into our dream home in South Africa. Some part of me felt that this was a way out. I could stay, we could stay married and stay obedient in that sense, and I could carry on here and she could stay, stay there. But God spoke to her. And the day she said, I'm be obedient to God. God healed our marriage. It's been 20 years, 19 years since then. And we've known tremendous blessing and joy in our marriage. Because my wife was obedient to God and chose God over her daughters. For God wants to bless us. But we need to let go. And we need to put him first. And here's the bottom line. Many who are first will be last and what is last will be first. First. You cannot hold on to things that God takes the place of God. In the end, you will pay the price. Folk, I'm not a prophet, but listen to me. Remember what I said this morning. Put God first and know his blessing. Put anything else first. And you will know heartache. The choice is yours. Remember Lot. Remember Abraham. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your desires for us is good. And Lord, that you in every way want to help us and bless us and encourage us. And Lord, want us to prosper. And yet, Lord, we so often feel that we can take things in our own hands and we can control our own lives and our own families. Give us grace, Lord, to be obedient to you, just like Abraham was. 
And Lord, to choose you first and to leave the rest in your hands. Help us to understand, Lord, but above all, help us to do. Father, as I said earlier, I cannot understand what went on in Abraham's heart when he raised that knife to the son that he loved. But I understand his devotion to you. And I pray, Lord, that we may have one God only. And that is not our kids and our grandkids and our brothers and sisters and fathers and family. And I thank you, Lord, that in your promise you, you will return that which we have surrendered for your sake. Help us understand, Lord. Help us, above all, to find it in our hearts to do the right things. I ask this in Jesus' name. I pray that you'd go with us, Lord. Keep us, protect us. Bring us together again safely on Thursday. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.